Producer dude, here we are again, another podcast, and we have a guy who I've known for a very long time, and you know, we kind of talked about you know how well the fisheries people do, you know, with Travis or the goot as we call him with the acoustic telemetry. And so we figured we'd take a little bit different approach. So we're gonna bring on a, a longtime friend of mine who's now in the guy running the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. So he has a different aspect of you know what he's overseeing in the fisheries. It's not really fish management, which is what he used to do um, at the state of Ohio. So I'm sure you're going to be intrigued by this one because I know you like the uh, the fisheries aspect of it or the biology stuff. Yeah, these are my favorite, so I'm really looking forward to it. Let's bring in our old buddy, Jeff Tyson. I see an Ohio State deal in the background there, and considering you're sitting in Michigan and near a state that I, I don't even want to say what city we're near. <laughs> Yeah, we've got uh, divided uh, loyalties here in the Tyson house. So Ohio State, Michigan State, and Mizzou. So, oh my, that's that's a lot of jerseys. Yes, it is. <laughs> Any rate, so you know we've had uh, Travis Hartman on the podcast several times. He's the fisheries director, whatever you want to call it. Now, fun fact: you had that position for a number of years, and it's actually been a lot longer than I thought. How? How? Give us a little background on that. Yeah, so I was the program administrator down in Ohio, uh, what was it, 2012 to 2010 to 2016, something like that, and then took a position up here uh, with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, uh, working across the Great Lakes rather than just on Lake Erie. So now you're basically doing kind of different, right? But you're over the Great Lakes. So tell me what this new position is and, and... kind of how that affects us here. Sure. So I work for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, which was essentially established by treaty back in the 1950s to facilitate coordinated fishery management, control sea lamprey, and and, uh, develop research to help inform fisheries management on the Great Lakes Basin. And my role here is in the fisheries management directorate. So I work with a lot of the state, provincial, tribal, and First Nation agent fisheries management agencies to sort of facilitate that coordinated fishery management. And I also focus on environmental and habitat uh, initiatives across the basin projects to try to make more fish to, to, to meet uh, fisheries needs. So this was maybe be even a more, more proactive type thing is what you're looking at. Well, uh, yeah, that's the hope. Um, at the end of the day, if we do good things on the landscape to make more fish, it's going to put more fish in the box for folks. And and there's lots of work that we can do across the basin. Uh, we're identifying those priorities and trying to get projects on the ground to, to do that. So kind of in layman's terms, um, a lot of the stuff that I'm always amazed is you're dealing with the habitat where you were dealing more with the fish at the fisheries, right? So some of the stuff you told me about, like the water temperature even compared to years back, like g- give us a background on like how really the Great Lakes has evolved. Yeah, sure. So the Great Lakes are changing and they, they change on a decadal and, and, and longer scale, obviously. And um, back in the I think we talked about it back in the you know late 1800s, mid late 1800s. The fish community was quite a bit different uh, in in all the Great Lakes, primarily because of. Uh, uh, climate and, and, and temperature, we're coming out of what was called the Little Ice Age back in the late 1800s. And the fish community in Erie in particular was comprised mostly of what we call corrigonids, which was Lake Herring, Lake Whitefish. And, um, you know, back in the late 1800s, 90 million pounds of fish flesh were harvested with about 60% of those being Lake Herring and, and, and uh, Whitefish. Lake Herring no longer exist in the system. Uh, the Lake Erie Committee is is pursuing uh, potential reintroduction of Lake Herring into that system, but it's changed because it was a lot colder back then. And as we came out of that little ice age, the fish community shifted to more cool water species like uh, walleye and yellow perch, which we see now. Well, it's it's kind of funny you say that because as we sit here, it's the middle of winter or supposed to be, you know, and it was 60 degrees a couple of days ago. And that just, I always tell people that like, oh, it's so nice. We get an early start in the season. And I'm like, yeah, but we're, you know, generally speaking, I don't know, this may be go back to your old job, but it seems like, you know, we have a better spawn when we have a hard winter. It kills things off, right? Like there's like a hundred effects of why we want a hard, you know, winter for the, for the big picture of everything, bait fish, just. Mm-hmm. you name it yeah. and 
are we're just probably in one of those little cycles, right? We're in year two of essentially no ice on Lake Erie. Right. Yeah. And, and I, you know, that doesn't mean there won't be ice again on Lake Erie. I mean, we went through a warm spell prior to the 2014, 2015 hard water seasons that, that were, you know, pretty, pretty good years for, for being out on the ice, but the two years prior were pretty warm and we didn't have much ice at all. So it's going to cycle for sure. And interannual variability. So variability from year to year, it kind of is going to be there and we'll see cold, cold winters, but not like what we did back in the late 1800s. And one thing that I, I'm kind of a weather geek and I'm always looking at highs and lows. And most of the highs and lows that we set were set during the, um, late 1800s and 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 now um with both highs and lows when we're coming out of these kind of major climate regimes if you will like the little ice age so when you say you're a weather geek here like it was the winter of 14 and 15 like back to back we had you could drive to canada on a snowmobile you didn't have to sput around like it was just it was solid ice i think we had 100 percent coverage or whatever yeah did you is are there modules or anything to predict that because i mean as i sit here at least on my end you know we're i, I ice fish i'm trying to figure this out we're trying to book you know trips and people and stuff and it doesn't seem like they ever have it figured out you know there's like oh our farmer's almanac says that's a hard winter and then it seems like a month later they say farmer's almanac says it's not and i'm like that's not how this works like what what is the deal and you say you, you know we've seen these patterns in the past like could could you predict being the weather geek that this year and last year were going to be mild yeah no i mean that's tough because a lot of the sort of these broad scale weather patterns are driven by you know really localized effects so when we get when we get a, a polar vortex that swings down because of the jet jet stream has dropped you can't predict that um within within that level of accuracy so most of the predictions that you see on kind of what weather's going to look like that are generally close are things that are longer term so over the next decade we're going to see potentially cooler or warmer temperatures associated with el nino or la nina and those kinds of things but yeah the 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 year-to-year -year variability is really tough to predict so you're saying there's a chance this next decade we might actually get to use our ice augers i sure hope so i, I was on the ice twice this year which was not good no that's that's two times more than many of us though it's uh kind of a crazy thing so back when you said okay this water is like breaking this down the water was cooler like what's the definition of cooler because that's everything's relative there yeah right so um cooler generally means you know probably maximum temperatures in the in the 60s you know the the low mid 60s so quite a bit cooler at uh, midsummer all right so uh now we're seeing temperatures you know in the mid 70s ish and that's that's really suitable for the cool water species that are dominant out there right now like walleye and yellow perch that's uh, i mean that's so when this happened i obviously like lake leary is kind of, kind of my background obviously mm -hmm. and where i spend most of my time but lake superior is always a lot colder like what yep. what did the other great lakes were they also like lake michigan lake huron seeing these same huge Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, the fish community like in Lake Superior, though, is is largely intact because it is so much further north and they maintain those cooler temperatures throughout the summer. So they've got, you know, a, a really dominant Cisco or Lake Herring uh, community. Uh, they've got, you know, a strong Lake Whitefish fishery. Lake Trout are, are still prevalent in the system, both leans and fats. So it's largely intact, although Lake Superior is also warming at, at a higher rate than, than, than most of the other Great Lakes. So with that said, I guess it's, it's kind of in my brain seems backwards because I remember another thing you said is, you know, that we're not nearly as productive, uh, you know, as far as amount of fish or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then when I hear it was cooler before, that kind of my brain doesn't work right. You know, it doesn't seem like it's backwards because, you know, Lake Superior isn't nearly as productive uh, because of the because of the cold right? right so lake erie they say oh it's shallow and fertile and it turns over the water quickly and da 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 da. And there's more bait and all that so it's like it just my brain's kind of explained that to me where it's like we were more productive when we were colder but yet we're learning now lake erie's productive because it's warmer than the surrounding great lakes yeah well that's that's all relative so at the end of the day the productivity in erie was still pretty high way back in the early 1800s obviously even when it was cold because of the landscape so um we've got 
a, a unique landscape on Erie that um, essentially was productive. It was moving lots of sediment and, 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 and likely carbon into the system prior to kind of the change in the landscape with, with the industrial agriculture, the advent of industrial agriculture and those kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, so, so break down landscape for us that are listening to this that are maybe like, huh? Sure, yeah. Well, so what, what I'm talking about is, is kind of how the land has changed and that impacts the fish fisheries and fish communities. So back, you know, in the early days, uh, we had um, essentially a fish community that was probably capitalizing on every piece of energy that came into the system because they were in balance. Uh, the fish community was structured such that it could take advantage of that those nutrients that came in. Um, and but it was a different fish community, obviously, uh, because the landscape was different. Um, we didn't have uh, large scale industrial agriculture. We hadn't had um, significant modifications in sort of ports of, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of like the port of Toledo, which went in in the 1920s, highly productive area for, for making fish flesh, essentially. And all the modifications there essentially compromise the ability of those fish to to make the amount of fish flesh that they used to essentially so and when you say like industrial i mean some of that are we talking because i know that's a hot uh, hot topic especially for some of my friends that are farmers oh, yeah. are we talking about basically some runoff in the lake things like that or those are the kinds of things yeah so it's 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 not just runoff but it's 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 sediment it's the impact of sediment on the environment and the habitat out there that makes fish and i'm not knocking uh, industrial agriculture i come from an ag background as well but it's just a reality that we have to deal with in the fisheries management community is that the landscape has changed and um it really has to some degree compromise the ability of the lakes to produce the amount of fish that they used to produce. Now, the, the upside is, is there's things that we can do to enhance that productivity. And that's one of the things that I'm doing through the Great Lakes Fishery Commission is working on that environmental and habitat side to try to focus in on areas that are really important for uh, making fish and the kinds of fish that folks um, both recreational, commercial, so, and traveling. Before we even jump ahead to that, it's like, so down in Venice, Louisiana, they're losing, I, I don't know, don't quote me, but it's something crazy to me, like 200 yards of shoreline a day, um, mm -hmm. you know, that these, there is eroding off or something like that. Do we have yep. that on, and, and again, obviously I'm a Lake Erie guy, but I think we can even open this conversation up to the Great Lakes because, sure. and, and, and let us know, you know, what are some differences on some of these things from Lake Huron to Erie and stuff like that as we talk. So we'll, we won't pigeonhole ourselves completely, but because right. um, again, people listening to this are, you know, a majority of them probably don't, aren't on Lake Erie, but yeah. um, you know, are we losing shoreline stuff and we don't even realize it on the Great Lakes or Erie? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that is, Erie's kind of unique because it's so shat, flat and shallow um, that, you know, um, that uh, most of it has been armored, so we're not losing, you know, quote unquote shoreline relative to uh, changes in lake. And level. when you say armored, like literally rocks from people mm -hmm. developing, or yep, yep, yep. Put yeah, I mean, you see Lake water. Michigan, like you see on on the Michigan side of Lake Michigan, like it's literally falling into the lake, and then you are in a hundred feet of water, you know, a hundred yards offshore or something, you know, close yep. to that. So yep. So uh, higher lake levels in Lake Michigan have generated quite a bit of coastal erosion, both on the Michigan and Wisconsin shorelines. And the answer has been put armor stone in. And in a lot of cases, that armor stone is not nearly as productive at growing larval fish as that softened shoreline that used to be there. So they're losing productive capacity every time, you know, some of this armor stone goes in. Um, now they're losing shoreline as well, which is, is something that obviously has implications for, you know, property owners and, and those kinds of things. So there's got to be a better solution. And that's some of the things that we're trying to work through with this environmental and habitat initiative as well. Offshore breakwaters that reduce energy in the nearshore zone, maintain that nearshore zone for larval uh, production capacity and those kinds of things. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, so what are what are the hot 
buttons or if you will the hot topics as far as things that you're fighting on a, on a daily basis with like i mean the farmer thing is just something i think of maybe it's because i know so many farmers but mm-hmm. you know they keep talking about hey don't do this and then it's like well you guys want to eat uh, but you know the fertilizer runoff i think through the like mommy uh, basin yeah um, is one of the big ones i know in canada we've got a bazillion of those greenhouses and those uh, i think tomato farms aren't they tomato farms yeah mm-hmm. up around right. like leamington and, and stuff like that but so how, I mean, how do those really impact? Like the, the, those people that don't know, there are these tomato farms that are like, I mean, gargantuan, just acres upon eight acre, miles upon miles up there yeah. on the um, the North Shore of Canada. W- what exactly? I mean, because it seems like, again, I'm not, I don't know about this stuff, but where we see the algae blooms is generally around those. Like in Canada, up there in near Point Pelee and that, they have a huge algae bloom when we do have one. Um, yeah. The same thing at Maumee Bay or what have you. So, um, Yeah, so <clears throat> that's one of the things that, that we're working through is implementing projects and locations that are important for fish production that will essentially reduce or mitigate uh, the impacts of agricultural runoff. So, for example, we've got a project going in <clears throat> in the city of Maumee that creates um, or is intended to create some offshore connected coastal wetland habitat, um, some softened shoreline there that can revegetate, that that can hopefully not only provide structural cover for for larval walleye, white bass, lake sturgeon, but also uh, help to uh, reduce some of the nutrient loads that are going in. to the system as well as the sediment. So there's there's, th- there's things that can be done to reduce uh, overland sediment erosion beyond just, you know, conservation tillage and those kinds of things. We can do some other things on the landscape in important spots for fish production to help reduce the impacts of those. Now it's gonna take a lot of work because we've had 150 years worth of development in the basin that we've been working incrementally to try to address through some of these uh, habitat improvement projects. Well, let's. Say- um, let's uh, just assume that all of a sudden we didn't have farms for our farm fields or we didn't have the tomato farms and we just look literally or they they went out of business for a year or something mm-hmm. would we see some effects of that still or would it be like a light switch and we're just boom we're good right and so i suspect and, and i'm not a, a nutrient ecologist but i suspect there's there's legacy impacts from from uh, uh, the modern industrial agriculture that would last for quite a while. So turning the switch off tomorrow wouldn't result in a response next year or the year following likely. Yeah, because I think, you know, the thing people always like, oh, they're, they're, it's just the world we're in. They're quick to judge. And I pick on those things just because I see them. Like I physically can see that, you know, a lot of the stuff I think we're doing damage with, we don't maybe necessarily see it with our eyes right away or all at one time. Um, But when people see those algae blooms, it's just like the channel, you know, 10 news or whatever, they come down to the docks and they do their little TMZ bullshit with, oh my God, the world's ending. Look at this. And then we go three or four years where I'm on the water almost daily and I don't see any algae blooms. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially, even we just had kind of a, a warm summer uh, for, for a little bit there. And, you know, I didn't see, I'm not saying it didn't happen somewhere, but I didn't see the algae blooms um, going back to like, I don't know, maybe it was back probably when you were at the state of Ohio still probably 10 or 12, something like in that range. We had a couple of years there where, I mean, it was like soup. Oh yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, and, and it bloomed and it was like plastic. Like what exactly is that? I mean, it was like hard plastic feeling that algae, mm-hmm. yeah. not just that soup. Yeah, that was that was microcystis. I mean, that was a blue green algae. When I the first time I saw blue green algal bloom, and it, it wasn't near as severe as it was in in you know the mid 2010s, but it was uh, 1995. It was east of Kelly's, and it was it was an odd pop up that that uh, occurred out there for whatever reason, and it was I didn't know what it was. We were out doing lower trophic level sampling and collected blue green algae in 1995 so it, you know it's been around and it's it in, in smaller patches but obviously it's, it's gotten more severe over the past few years and it's it, again they've got a predictive model for that that's based on essentially rainfall and temperature during the spring which is most most when most of the runoff comes off the phosphorus uh 
off the ag fields. And so they can predict relatively well the extent of the bloom, but again, it's spatially variable and and it's based on precipitation patterns on an annual basis. And, and uh, so people listen to this to kind of put a couple of pieces together. Cause I know you, it's just like me with fishing, you know, you assume cause you this, you know, this in and out so well. The, we get the runoff from the springtime, whether it's snow or rain or both, and yep. then, um, but we don't have it immediately because that algae bloom takes what seventy degrees, or what's the temperature to? Yeah, it's yeah sixty, seventy degrees, something like that. I, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but yeah, you don't see it immediately. So it's it's a response of the algae that's in the system to the inputs of the nutrients and sunlight. So it takes some time for that to actually bloom, just like your tomatoes in the garden, right? <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> usually see it in like what late July, Ross. Yeah, when exactly. You really it's start like, to see it when the water does get up over 70, 75 degrees. Yeah. yeah I want to say it's like 70, it's like 70 degrees. I mean, producer dude lives on the water down there in Michigan and you know, he's in that kind of bay a little bit where he'll see some of that uh, kickoff from like mom. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is there any, I mean, is there any positive to that? I mean, is there any like bait fish that like, you know, because again, people are always like, that's why when you said cold and more productive, like my brain, because I know this on a very simple scale, it's like, well, Erie's warmer, so we get more plankton, and then the plankton leads to more bait fish, and da 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 da, da like the whole chain reaction. So, yeah. is, is there any good that comes out of it? Well, <laughs> yes and no, I guess. I, I think, you know, at the, at the end of the day, um, excessive phosphorus and blue-green algal blooms are, are not good for for a whole host of reasons. We don't need that from a fishery standpoint, the potential youth and health and, health and human safety issues, which are, you know, who knows, they're pretty fuzzy, but uh, the the uh, aesthetics of it, no, that's not good. Um, now, at the end of the day, though, I think it does impact fish behavior. So, you know, I've, I've heard folks that, that uh, actually target blooms due to the impact on light levels and, and have higher catch rates for particularly walleye in, in the blooms. Um, yellow perch, not as much. I hear folks avoid that. Now, I, that's not that's not founded in any formal science by any stretch of the imagination, but it can potentially impact distribution of fish out there. Yeah, I mean, and so people listening to this that haven't been through one of these blooms, I mean, it's to the point where, like, it's on your boat. It's like a moss. It's like a slime, I guess, maybe be it, where you can troll through and you can see your path an hour later. Yeah. Like it's, it's, you know, when it's flat, obviously. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that stuff is always in the water. Same so I just wonder even too, because when it's flat, it's like, it coats it like slime, but yeah. we get rough and it gets all kind of turned up and you just don't notice it nearly as much. And I wonder just exactly. it seems to always be rough around here anymore. If, you know, how much of that is in the system or layered and it just, does it just rise to the top? Uh, yeah. like cream basically. Yep. It does. When, when you have, uh, essentially calm conditions that's when it it sort of gets buoyant and floats up to the surface and and that's when you see it but yeah it's in the, it's in the system uh you know so when it's really rough is it literally on rocks on the bottom no it's it's suspended in the water column so it's just mixed in um mm -hmm. so you, you think about a calm day when you don't have a lot of turbulence uh these cells the microcystis cells are semi-buoyant and, and they they do they will float up to the top so you're getting the entire water column that's essentially rising up to the top which gives you that you know the scum on the surface yeah i know we're kind of all over the place because it's like so many of these things are intermingled right mm -hmm. and like going backing up again we talked to kind of quickly about like um you know the change in the landscape i think was your your verbiage on that when you go to Lake Michigan for people, that's a good example. There is not nearly the people there on the water when you go down the Michigan, the Wisconsin, even the North End, uh, La Beta Knock and stuff like that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know exactly why all that is. Part of it probably is access. Some of it's, you know, state, federal land or whatever. But on, on Erie, it just seems like, again, back in the day, I mean, the, the number of factories that were on Erie that supplied the big three or something like that. I mean, the number of freighters that, that came through there, um, you know, yeah, Chicago or something like that. But is that part of it? I mean, there's more, there's got to be more houses on the water on Erie than the other Great Lakes. Like Lake Huron's also just vacated almost. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, here he is is the most populous uh, of the Great Lakes uh, for for sure. And I and part of that goes back to the landscape again. I mean, you look look out your window in Toledo, and you can see to to the high point over at Bowling Green. So that's that 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 makes for easy easy access, easy development, um, those kinds of things. Where you're talking, you know, some of the sheer cliffs on on the uh, eastern side of Lake Michigan that that don't make for as, as easy access you know, those kinds of things. So, so yeah, um, I, you know, particularly the Western end of Erie is, is very heavily developed because of the landscape. It's flat. It's easy to move things around and get stuff done. So, you know, what bait fish I, besides, cause again, when you start thinking my, my, there's always this cause and effect, right? Like everything, well, when the lake was cooler. So a lot of people have listened to our stuff before with uh, Travis or our friend affectionately known as the Goot yeah. uh, with, with acoustic telemetry stuff. You know, a lot of these things are all intermingled, right? And, and you talk about the bait fish. So like right now, we shot a video. We went down to the eastern side of the central basin, basically Ohio, Pennsylvania line, shot mm-hmm. a video, killed it. You know, smelt. Right. And then, you know, we talk about early and late in the season, we start seeing gizzard shad and gizzard shad are a little more temperature sensitive, meaning that they need it warmer. Right. We're kind of on the north range of those where smelts kind of the opposite. Uh, They're an in-betweener. Right. But you they they basically go east to look for the cooler water. So back in the day, is it fair to say we probably didn't have gizzard shad then? Likely not. So that's that's one of the things that's sort of semi-debated in in uh in fishery circles whether gizzard shad were uh, are even considered native to to lake erie um particularly given sort of the little ice age history now cisco lake herring were actually the 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 dominant bait fish back back then small cisco so um completely different bait fish community um, so like likely emerald shiners rainbow smells or, or cisco not, and lake herring are, are those like is those that are, a spelling difference or what, what's the they're they're the same critter um lake herring Histor- they've historically been called lake herring, but uh, there have been some, there's been quite a bit of work on different uh, species and morphs. So, um, is that like saying pop and soda? Depends on where you're at. What you're at. <laughs> well, it depends on who you are. I'm a lumper. So, yeah, it's like saying pop and soda. But Oh, boy. This is our first Jeffism. Um, <laughs> you guys that don't know Jeff like I do, uh, there's a lot of Jeffisms, which we'll get to later. But um, oh, so, what, what exactly was this uh, pop equivalent that I've never heard of? <laughs> what you was so, a, lump, a lumper? Lumpers and splitters. <laughs> oh, Cis- boy. Yeah, so Cisco are kind of a unique critter. They're a unique animal that have a lot of different morphs or body shapes. And um, lumpers like me call them all Cisco's, where um, splitters call them bloater, which from an ichthyological standpoint, bloater are different than chi or different than than the arted eye, which is a different one, or different than short nose. They're all kind of similar silvery fish that sort of provide the base uh, of the, the prey base in a lot of the Great Lakes. Like I said, Lake Superior has a, a very strong Cisco complex, a lot of silvery fish that feed everything. But I still want to know what this lumpers and splitters thing is. I don't, I, don't, I mean, I'm <laughs> <laughs> is this a well, I, I call them all Cisco's and throw them in the same pile and say they're all little silver fish where the splitters say this one's got a bigger eye than the other one it must be a a short jaw Cisco or something Ross here it is wait 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 here it is I think I figured it out so a lumper lumps everything together and a splitter splits things into categories you're yeah, 100 you. on. I was trying. I was trying to get him to say it, and because I figured there would be another Jeffism in there. Oh, <laughs> um, but producer dude is spot on. I believe is, is he not? Producer dude. <laughs> yeah, he is always. He's always breaking down our mumbo jumbo. He's become a professional at it. But um, I was talking more about the the pop. I mean, what do you, as a Missouri guy, call pop? Is it soda? <laughs> I mean, you've lived in Ohio longer than you've been in, in Missouri now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We or used is it all, Coke. Yeah. Or we is used it, yeah. All, all Coke. Yeah. yeah. White Coke, orange Coke. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, funny. My dad grew up in a uh, long, many, many times ago in Missouri and they called it RC. 
Uh huh. Because yeah. that I, maybe that was even before Coke. I don't know, but yeah, get me an RC Cola. <laughs> yeah. So we like the Emerald Shiner that could have lived in those temperatures, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they yeah. like cold stuff. Um, do you think that? Again, when you get on like those bigger fish, so the gizzard shad or smelt and things like that, though the bigger fish seem to prefer those and eat those. I don't know whether that tastes better or the size or more protein. Yeah. Is that also maybe a part of the reason of being more productive back in the day? Um, yeah, I mean, it very well could be. So um, the the Cisco's or the Lake Herring will get, I mean, they do look a lot like a gizzard shad. They're high in fat content, those kinds of things. So a lot, really efficient energy transfer from say the plankton up to the predators, um, as opposed to, you know, a, a smelt is not as, as, as rich in energy. A goby is not as rich in energy as say the, the, the herrings, the, lake herring or the the clupeids which is the gizzard shad so i mean if i was to close my eyes and kind of visualize back 300 years ago or whatever you're going back with some of these changes i mean we would have had that's before we had factories all over cleveland and the cuyahoga was catching on fire right so Mm -hmm. we we probably have a lot cleaner water especially with the cooler water generally Mm -hmm. cooler water means cleaner water or, or less sediment and such right Mm -hmm. and then uh do we have any other major differences visually looking at it besides not seeing houses and you know waste being pumped into it well yeah i mean it was largely forested right and so the west end of of erie was the the great black swamp so you look out over over, you wouldn't know it was as flat as it was because it was was largely tree covered with lots of carbon so trees drop carbon in the system and and that carbon was converted into energy by essentially benthic invertebrates that were then really efficiently moved up the food chain to support um, the the fish biomass that was in the system. So it is a big part, I mean, obviously I know there's no way to know this for sure, but is there speculation about invasives back in the day? I mean, or a lot of our invasives, let's say like zebra mussels, um, mm-hmm. I think maybe gobies, those came in from ships like ballast water. Yeah. Right. So if we're talking Viking periods of times or, or something like that, like I'm assuming that uh, we didn't have the transfer like we do now. Right. Did we have invasives back in the day? Ross, I suspect we did because we as, as people move stuff around, right? Um, uh, pro- not at the level that we are that we do now with with modern transportation and those kinds of things and and the global economy. But yeah, I, I suspect the critters were moved here and there. Um, whether they established and and impact the system at the level they do now, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I, I suspect we we move stuff. <laughs> So with that said, I mean, your day to day is a lot of your focus, because, again, you can only do what you can do. And again, I think that people this is not like hitting the ball like you just don't you got one second to make the contact. Right. Like this is a lot of what you're trying to do is be more proactive, I guess, mm-hmm. yeah. or or slowly take care of things uh, that are already existing. So like invasive species, what's our hit list as far as, you know, maybe starting with the not so as big of a deal if you can say that to the nightmare situation like let's let's yeah those up. yeah and, and that's another thing that really does impact the the ability to produce fish in the system is these invasive species that come into the system that you don't know the impact of so you essentially have to manage around them um, if you know how many times I, i've used your line from god i don't know back in 2000 when you you know me and you were buddies and you told me it's like ross we don't know the long-term effect of invasives so they think of them as cancer you know because and, and and the reason that that statement i think originally came out by you and you were saying it so frequently was when people were like these zebra mussels man, we have a much cleaner lake now. And then it was the gobies. Oh my God, all the smallmouth are eating these gobies. We have so many more smallmouth. And you're like, there's always a catch. There's yep. always a catch. Hold on, you know, yep. wait till this bites us. But so l- let's rank the um, the invasives right now that we have. Sure. So, uh, you know, I think one that in Erie we forget about, but at a great lakes basin wide scale, it's still there and it's still causing issues is the, the sea lamprey. 
Um, one of the mandates for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission is to implement sea lamprey control across the basin. Um, they got into the system, you know, really back in the 1920s with the opening of the Welland Canal and largely decimated the fisheries across the basin. So lake trout disappeared from Erie, um, Huron, Michigan, largely depressed, Superior, same thing. Um, so that's still out there. It's still an important program. The Fishery Commission and its contracting partners, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and DFO, do a fabulous job of suppressing sea lamp rate to the tune of about $20 million, $20, $25 million a year. So, so, people, so, so people that don't know what a lamprey is, essentially it looks kind of like a snake with a suction-like mouth, almost kind of a cartoon character. And they literally attach on to these fish, right? And they basically suck the life out of them. And if yep. you've ever caught a fish with like a perfect circle, maybe the size of a half dollar, um, where it's really red or eaten away, <laughs> Rufus is not liking the neighbor there. <laughs> <laughs> but um the lamprey situation is like i mean i see a few here but we've also got i from what i understand with with travis we've got two different types one's a one is a native and one is mm -hmm. not and yep. so explain the difference on those um with the invasives like because the other ones obviously you're not as concerned with sure so sea lamprey got into the system they're largely constra they were largely constrained to the east west coast uh europe um they spent the majority of their life out in the ocean, migrated upstream to reproduce. They opened the Welland Canal and they got into the Great Lakes and adapted to fresh water. Sea lamprey get big. Um, they get much larger than the, what we call the native lampreys, so the brook and the silver lamprey, which are much smaller. Um, and because they get much larger, they kill their host, where um, a brook and, and uh, silver lamprey are much smaller. They don't kill their host. They are parasitic, um, but but they don't have the devastating effect on on these larger host fish that the sea lamprey do, just because sea lamprey were not in this system. They didn't co-evolve. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I've only had like one confirmed sea lamprey. Most of the ones that I've had hooked on to fish through years, which is not really a lot relative, uh -huh. um, was a silver, according to uh, you or somebody else that I sent pictures to. But yeah. They're yeah. pretty crazy. I mean, when they come off, sometimes they'll suck onto the bottom of your boat. Mm -hmm. Same down there. They're a little aggressive. But yeah. So what are we doing to eliminate those? I mean, is it like the Asian carp where we have like a barrier of some type or how? No. Um, crews with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and DFO, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, go out annually uh, to uh, it's a witch hunt. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> witch hunt. <laughs> Actually, it's a very targeted witch hunt. They go out to several hundred tributaries across the Great Lakes Basin and apply uh, TFM, which is a lampricide, and kill off the larval uh, sea lamprey on an annual basis. So, so is this like hold, hold up here for us that I need to mm -hmm. uh, follow along real straight. So that's like, are you f like a chemical you're dumping something in, or is this yeah. like a Yep, it is a chemical that uh, the crews discharge into the stream at a certain concentration, keep that concentration up down through larval sea lamprey habitat stretches in the river, and it kills the, the sea lamprey. Uh, they've, they're, it's very effective. Uh, sea lamprey populations have been reduced by about 90% across the basin, which is probably the most successful aquatic invasive species control program in the world. Um, and it's primarily just by doing this chemical in the tributaries? Yep. Chemicals in the tributary are um, one of the primary tools. Uh, barriers are also so uh, a tool for uh, limiting sea lamprey production. So dams and streams that don't allow them to get up to reproductive habitat uh, uh, are another tool. That's one that I'm working with because I'm working through opening up streams to ensure that native fish and the fish that feed fisheries can get upstream. So we've got some work going on with the selective fish passage to try to move the kinds of fish upstream that we want and then keep the sea lamprey out. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, the million dollar question is, is you know, you're pouring chemicals and people hear that and they're like, uh, I mean, yeah. there, there has to be some type of kickback. It's just like any medication you take, right? Like there's always there's always some negative, like what other species or things are potentially harmed by that? Yeah. And 
TFM, which is the lamprosite that's used, is is very selective. Um, it primarily targets sea lamprey, but it does have some non-target effects on things like mud puppies, uh, which is a concern. Um, in some cases, uh, like in Lakes Michigan and Huron, if there's an early run of salmon, it can have an impact on salmon survival, it, the adult adults in the stream. So lake sturgeon, young lake sturgeon are uh, susceptible to elevated mortality from TFM. So in many cases, uh, crews will go in and remove juvenile lake sturgeon from the system prior to a treatment and then put them back in. So th the impacts are minimal, but they are there. You're, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's, there's still, uh, you know, um, other impacts associated with applying lamprosite to the system. Um, human health and safety risks are minimal, very minimal with, with the uh, uh, chemical that's being used, but it is the most effective tool that we have at this point in time in the toolbox to, to continue to suppress sea lamprey. So what's, what's next on the list of invasives? Well, I, I put the zebra and quagga mussel up there right near the top just because of their impact on productivity in the system. Um, their what, what we call ecosystem engineering impact. So not only do they impact productivity through their filter, filter feeding, um, they encrust a lot of quality habitat out there that used to produce fish and now doesn't produce as many fish. Um, they've had massive impacts in Lakes Michigan and Lake Huron. Uh, thankfully, Lake Superior is a, it's a relatively low calcium system, so they have difficulty forming their shells. But there are some pockets of uh, dracaenids, so zebra and quagga mussel up there as well. But they have completely changed how the system functions and, and really physically what it looks like, right? Yeah, I mean, zebra mussels, like, you know, bass guys, which, you know, we hate the bass guys. No offense. Um, they always like them because they want to be able to, it helps the bass fishery. They can see better and mm -hmm. see their little fish hit and all that ding dong stuff. But um, when you have more light penetration, you have, I mean, for the walleye fishing, it, I, I would say it makes it tougher just because those fish, like the old days of casting a weight forward, you know, man, how come isn't that doesn't work as good? Well, it's like when those fish can see 30 feet, um, it's a little different deal. And they yeah. tend to spread out a lot more than when they see your, you prop. Know, <laughs> you, you see your prop. You can read the serial number, you know, on that <laughs> yeah. stuff. But um, so with the zebra mussels, what are some of the other things on how that, besides making cleaner water, again, maybe somebody doesn't think of the fact, hey, when you have that cleaner water, now we have more light penetration. And yes, that makes fish spookier. But on um, what you're more concerned with, because I most of the things I hear with you is not how it affects those fishermen as far as catching or not catching. It's more of the system, meaning we've got more weeds potentially, right? Yep. So if those weeds grow up because we have more light penetration, in some cases, that's not good. Or, I, you know, walk, walk me through some of the things maybe we're not thinking about with that sure so i think that the first thing that we need to talk about with, with zebra and quagga mussels is their impact on sort of food resources for um, larval and juvenile fish so they're filtering out uh, phytoplankton zooplankton that would normally be supporting uh, growth and production of fish so that's reducing the, the the ability of the system to produce fish flesh right unless you're talking gobies is that a reason too why it seems like you know you come around here in august or something when people start perch fishing and half the time you can't get shiners mm -hmm. do we have a lot less i guess we kind of talked about the bait fish but do we have a lot less shiners or things like that because of what you just said i i you know yes i think so a, a lot of the eco e ecosystem models suggest that a lot of the energy is going through zebra mussels that would normally be up in sort of the pelagic regions not the benthic regions so all that energy is getting sucked down by the mussels and then essentially sequestered in in the sediments whereas it would normally be supporting um, phytoplankton and, and, and zooplankton production in the pelagic or in in the water column itself so they're, they're having an impact. Now, you know, there's enormous variability on an inter, in your interannual basis as well. So, I mean, depending on rain and, and temperature and those kinds of things. Um, other things that, that you're, you're 
the the impact you're right on is the you know increased light penetration increases uh, aquatic vegetation and there are a number of places across the great lakes where cladophora which is a benthic uh benthic algae um that uh is expressing in high abundance because of water clarity associated with zebra and quagga mussels so cladophora is 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 an algae that um it's a benthic algae that sloughs off washes up on the beaches causes low dissolved oxygen in in the benthic regions um, and also is associated with um, uh, some uh, impacts to uh, water birds and stuff like that so um, michigan lake michigan has significant issues with cladophora lake huron as well uh, portions of eastern lake erie um, have excessive growth of, of cladophora and that causes beach fouling and and, and other issues as well so um, that's one. The other one that that uh, we're trying to work through with some of the habitat restoration work is the impact of zebra mussels on spawning reefs. Um, they've completely encrusted spawning reefs. You've got this association of cladophora with zebra mussels, so they've reduced the productive potential of these reefs from a, from a spawning standpoint. And we're working through some solutions to try to figure out how to deal with that. Well, I can even remember back when you were in your other position talking about like in Maumee Bay or places like that where there were traditionally compacted mud and or sand bottom where the zebra mussels were literally paving that. Uh, mm -hmm. Like now we had asphalt of zebra mussels and fish because of that even harder bottom, fish were spawning on that, but you weren't thinking that the um, productivity was nearly as much on those places. Is that kind of still the thought? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Zebra mussel shells do provide some substrate, if you will, but they do embed in in the suitable substrate that's out there, making it, like you said, like asphalt, um, paving it over. There's no interstitial spaces. So when wind comes through or ice or whatever, uh, those eggs are getting dislodged and relocated to, to locations that are less suitable for hatching. And did these zebra mussels, I mean, it's pretty confirmed they came in ballast water, right? Do we have any idea, you know, where else are these? Because now, jumping ahead however many years it's been, you go to a small inland lake and they're like, they got zebra mussels. And, and producer, dude, do you remember this one? Um, when we did the uh, podcast just a month or two ago with the South Dakota fisheries guy, he had said, we don't have any zebra mussels in the system. And by the time that podcast had run, he sent me an email and said, we just found them in the system, you know, and again, it's, it's probably, you know, fishing boats, you know, live wells and trailers mm -hmm. and things like that. But the, I guess the point is even tiny little lakes, like these people that are going back and forth, you know, we're, it's like getting the flu. I mean, we're contaminating that, but mm -hmm. uh, where do we think that that started? Well, uh, really the, the first documented introduction of zebra mussels into the great lakes was in, in the Detroit area in the Detroit St. St. Clair river location really back, back in the uh, late 1980s um that that's that's not to say that they weren't in the system prior to that but that was the first documented case uh of, of dracaenids in the system and then they have obviously spread across the great lakes lakes lake michigan some of the footage the video footage there mm. is absolutely amazing uh, deeper portions of lake superior are completely carpeted with quagga mussels um completely changed the 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 you know the system the the complex uh of the system essentially the the bottom substrate is completely dead it's all quaggas uh can we blame this on can we blame this on the russians <laughs> i mean we're, we're, we're seriously do we know what country that these might have come from in the ballast or is that like too presumptuous uh well they came from the black and caspian sea region um for sure uh they were not the native yeah, they, they were not native to even parts of western europe and and they are well established there as well as throughout the great lakes and and, and obviously issues further west they're trying to minimize the introduction of zebra and quagga mussels into some of the western reservoirs what's next on our hit list of uh invasives yeah um you know i think probably uh the spiny water fleas um circopagus and 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 uh, uh 
those sort of larger zooplankton's are probably having bithotrephes or having a bigger impact on the system than what we know of. Um, I know, you know, there's been some issues and challenges with fisheries in Erie, particularly the Central Basin for, for yellow perch. And, and, and one of the hypotheses is that, that bithotrephes have kind of changed perch feeding behavior, essentially. So they're up in the water column. Yeah, know. let's... Yeah, let's expand on pond. So when we had Travis on the podcast one time, he was telling us that the spiny fleas come out kind of like the algae at a certain temperature. And I want to say mm -hmm. it was like 65 or 70 or something like that. Yeah. And until that, they weren't like full blown all over the place. And that if you think about it, backing up guys that, that fish eerie for perch, like we always seem to have this early perch season a little earlier than it was traditional. And then when perch season that, as I was a kid, you know, used to be getting in full effect, it just goes to shit. And the result was because of these spiny fleas. They're just everywhere and you catch a perch and they're full of them. And so, you know, guys are using fly rigs and a million different things now, but they're eating these little spiny fleas. And isn't that the same thing that I see in my trolling line all yep. bunched up? Mm -hmm. Yep. That cotton, cotton on your trolling line is, is, is primarily circopagus, which is another spiny spiny zooplankton that's non-native to the system and again and so how yeah how did these get in is this another water transfer deal yep likely a ballast ballast introduction now mm -hmm. one of the things that has changed is um a lot of the federal regulations around ballast particularly ships that are coming in um from eastern europe or from other ports uh, as they come through the the uh uh well in canal there are requirements for ballast exchange now in place that u.s coast guard is enforcing and and i think that has minimized um the the number of new introductions that are coming into the system through through that that vector not to say that there aren't additional ones coming in but we had a period there in the in the 1990s where lots and lots of stuff was coming in through through this ballast vector essentially and I'm, yeah i'm kind of honest i'm kind of honestly surprised that the sea fleas were that high in the list it seems like um i would think they'd be lower on your list of, mm -hmm. of importance things but i guess if they're single-handedly jacking up the perch deal um well and and they're having other impacts so they're predatory zooplankton so they're eating other zooplankton out there which is you know granted they they are essentially being incorporated in the other fish's diets but you're losing energy as they're eating essentially the the preferred zooplankton processing it generating you know 10 percent of the energy out of it into their into their biomass and then then moving that into the food web so you're you're essentially losing energy for fish flesh at the end of the day well and that's the thing that you know i've had when i've had other fisheries guys on here in the past is as i go can we how can we keep sustaining when we have these hatches of 100 million fish or what whatever that number is a lot right and then a lot yeah. again and then you look at you know the top 10 hatches are you know in the last 12 years or whatever that number is it's just yeah. substantial and then i'm like if dad works at the factory and he has two kids and they're getting by and then they have 10 more kids they adopt like how is dad feeding everybody and mom uh like you know and i think of the same thing with this fishery deal and then i'm starting hearing about well the sea fleas are eating our food you know we don't have as many shiners and then this and this and this and the zebra mussels are eating that stuff i mean is that why we're starting to see a shift in the bait fish um and is this something more important to think about for running out of food well, you know, I don't know about that, and that that's something that probably you'd have to talk with with uh, with Travis or you know some of the folks with the, the Division of Wildlife about. One of the keys that I looked at, I, you know, I think the productive potential for Erie is enormous, right? So you're you're getting 100 million walleye and and getting good hatches back to back to back because environmental conditions are right for for the hatches, and it's still sustaining them, right? Um, one of the things that I always looked at, and it's it, 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 it's one of those things that might be too late by the time you recognize it, is really what are growth rates doing? Are fish growing at you know reasonable rates, um, which to me indicates they're finding food, 
um, they're finding enough food to continue to grow and reproduce. And, and that's sort of the key. Uh, it's not going to express immediately. So if you have a crash in the prey fish population or something like that, then you may not see it until a year or two later. But if they're still growing, then obviously, I mean, at least based on my show me sense is that they're finding what they need to, to, to meet their needs, right? So what is next on our list after the sea fleas of, oh, my invasives? Oh, my gosh. Th those are the big ones in my, in my, in my book. Um, I mean, I would have to imagine, you know, I didn't, that's why I'm kind of surprised that the, the sea flea would almost be on the top of your deal. But I mean, mm -hmm. I think we have to, even though you would argue, I know you could argue this, but the one that you hear about the most, like if somebody doesn't fish, like Aunt Susie that doesn't fish mm -hmm. and she doesn't know about probably the things we just talked about, but she's probably heard about Asian carp. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and you're absolutely right. I was kind of focusing in on the, 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 invasives that were in the system, if you will. Um, a Asian carp are another uh, complete wild card. And if they get into the system, who knows what's going to happen? Um, they're obviously another another energy sink for um, production, fish production. So you're producing carp over other critters that you would prefer. Now, fortunately, there's uh, mechanisms in place, particularly in the Chicago area waterways, to try to minimize the risk of introduction through that vector for sure um, for big head, silver, and black carp. And, you know, we've got staff here at the Fishery Commission that, that are working with the Invasive Carp Regional Coordinating Committee to ensure that those mechanisms stay in place to minimize the risk in the Great I mean, like essentially electric fences type of thing? Right. Yep. Electric barriers, and uh, they've got other technologies that they're implementing as well, like carbon dioxide bubbling and and uh, uh, acoustic barriers and those kinds of things that that uh, they're implementing in Brandon Road and some of the other locations in the Chicago area waterways. You know, the one that always surprises me, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, is Kentucky Lake has been overrun by these. Yeah. Like what was a prolific, prolific, prolific bass lake. You can't even say bass stuff. It makes me angry. But, um, you know, it, it's coming back. But they were like over. I mean, people would see stuff on your sonar or your casting, and then you only realize it's just that they're just small Asian carp or giants. Uh -huh. um, and they were like netting these things, so like, like seening them essentially like overgrown commercial seening yeah. um, because there was just so many. Um, and again, we have had some fish in our system. I remember you telling me this a long time ago. We had that yeah. DNA in the system forever ago. Like somebody was caught many, many years ago, throwing them in the lake for some religious ceremony or something. I remember hearing that. Yeah. Um, but we just, they, is it because the habitat, you know, like again, the Illinois river or over there, they seem to be a shit pile of them in there, but that's more yeah. of because the conditions set up, is it the current, is it the warmth or. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, it's, it's the productivity, it's the current, it's the warmth. And I would argue that the Western basin is of Erie is really no different than a large river, right? Um, it, it's got current, it moves nutrients, energy, it's turbid. Uh, it's, it's, I would presume it would be highly suitable for production of big head and silver carp if they got into the system. Yeah, see, because I remember hearing people say that they didn't think it was conducive, and that's why we haven't, because we've, at some point we've had them in here, they just yep. haven't, you know, we don't reproduce to the point. Um, there's sturgeon in the system, but, you know, we don't see those um, mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Of course, I guess yeah. if we had Asian carp flying by out of the water, uh, as they do, yeah. we would... <laughs> be a little bit different so besides yeah. electric barriers uh and the uh, i think you said the acoustic where they probably hit them with some high pitch thing to kind of hold them down or whatever it is yeah to deter them or low pitch or whatever it would be but um uh, is there anything else i mean because it sounds like on the top and the bottom of the scale right like we're doing something for the lampreys we're doing something for the asian carp but with the zebra mussels or the um the fleas is there really anything we can do uh, that's a great question. Um, so with the zebra mussels, 
I'm part of a group. It's called the Invasive Muscle Collaborative. And that's what we're doing, at least right now, is exploring options for trying to control, at least at the site-specific level, dracenid muscles, zebra and quagga mussels to see if we can get a response in fish production. So we've got actually a couple of projects that are going in place here over the next few years that will start some experimental control at a very small site specific scale to see if we can generate a response in fisheries. So killing some zebra mussels, cleaning up some of that habitat, seeing if it results in increased hatches of, of things like lake whitefish. Hmm. But we really don't have any strategy at the basin wide scale or regional scale to control either zebra and quagga mussels or uh, the invasive zooplankters. I mean, I had to ask the question, but I figured if there was a method that you were using for zebra mussels, it's not working really good. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, they're just. Exactly. Well, you know, we've had them in the system for what, you know. 30, 40 years, and, and and we essentially managed around them, right? Shrugged our shoulders and said... It's like the flu. Like, you know, you can get rid of, you know, we don't have polio like we used to, right? But it's like the common flu just seems to just... That's like mm -hmm. the zebra mussels. It's just going to be here, and you deal with it, and, and yeah. hopefully there's there's not too many of the big issues. Well, now, I think now, hopefully we'll be able to actually get some science and information to start to understand whether we can develop some technologies to try to address these things, at least at the site specific scale and maybe at the regional scale. So there's some tools in development. You know, when you, when you took this position, I kind of think it's, and I'm sure you even have some, some family or some friends that don't really understand even what you do, because it seems to me like you do, you're almost involved in a little bit of everything, right? Because all these things are like, yeah, that, that would be a Travis thing or, or a Chris thing or whomever. Uh, in different agencies, different states, and even dealing with Canada. But yet, it's really kind of an odd, at least for an outsider, like what you're doing is you're trying to be proactive with things that you don't really have an answer to, right? Like, so there's no, this is what we're going to do today, and then it's going to be better tomorrow. Yeah. Like, yeah. But in the same aspect, I think things popping up, because like you mentioned at the very beginning with the, uh, the natives or Indians, whatever you want to call it, uh, I can remember... I don't know how long ago this was. I'm pretty sure you know about this where on North Bass Island, they wanted, they were claiming that that, you know, was their uh, territory or, or whatever that, that looked like. And they wanted to put mm -hmm. a casino there and a fish processing. That was the big one, the fish processing deal. Um, so people that are listening to this and maybe, you know, if you're in the Dakotas or something and don't know on Lake Michigan, there has been some issues. Uh, when I say love, hate and more hate than love, probably where they're running gill nets for salmon on Lake Michigan. And at times I've seen them when I'm fishing tournaments where they have these nets out there from, you know, hundred feet wide, so full of fish that they can't pull them out and they're left and they break free. Uh, you probably have heard these stories, but, um, you know, and I'm sure that there's been a little bit of tension with fisheries people and, and some of those, uh, the Indians or other through the reservations or however that works with their fisheries. But what happened, do you know, to get that shot down? Because that was, it made it into the court system pretty far, um, to get yeah. that, that Wait, commercial yeah. fishery essentially on Lake Erie. Yeah. And, and I think it was primarily, um, uh, tribal claim rights based on a treaty and Ross, this goes way back in my memory bank. So it's, it's, it's not completely clear. I don't think that tribal access rights were established through the treaty. And that's what came out of essentially the, the, uh, legal proceedings. They weren't formally established. Now they are formally established in a number of, uh, federally recognized tribes, um, in other locations in in the great lakes so 1836 um, treaty tribes have established um, rights rights holder rights i guess if you will for hunting fishing and and trapping in portions of uh northern lake huron lake michigan and lake superior uh 1842 tribes with uh, treaty tribes uh, are are also have uh, rights for commercial subsistence hunting fishing and and trapping um, not only in, in the reservation locations but in ceded territories um, they work very extensively with the state uh, 
fisheries management agencies to establish fish, fisheries management structures around how they're going to administer those fisheries to ensure sustainability. So we work a lot with the Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority, uh, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, and the 1840, uh, 1852 Treaty Authority through the Fishery Commission um, and, and other fisheries management agencies to ensure that everybody's kind of walking in lockstep relative to coordinated fishery management. Yeah, I mean, you know, the elephant in the room is you look at other fisheries and they've, you know, at times, you know, I hate to stereotype, but there's been a lot of this Indian netting that has really jacked up some stuff. I mean, I think of like Upper Red Lake in Minnesota where they had to put a moratorium and I mean, they basically just, you wipe it out, right? You run gill nets through there that are top to bottom. You basically are minnow seening, you know, but the game fish and you're in a bad way. And even a place like Erie could get jacked up with something as simple as perhaps that getting, you know, pushed through. Um, yeah, you know, I, and, and that's the thing that I'm fortunate that the fisheries management community around the Great Lakes, uh, you know, I work with a lot of good folks that are really heavily committed to coordinated fishery management so that while there is some tension with uh, within the between tribal state fisheries management agencies and, and federal agencies, they generally work it out and everybody is kind of on the same page relative to sort of what they need to do to ensure sustainability of the fisheries. So it's, it's really a good working situation in the Great Lakes. Um, Red Lake, you know, I'm not familiar with with sort of the situation there, but because of sort of the umbrella support of the Great Lakes Fishery uh, Commission, we've got really good working relations and have worked around a lot of those issues. Now, um, Michigan and, and the Chippewa Auto or Resource Authority tribes are currently going through negotiations for a fishing agreement um, in Lakes Michigan and uh, Huron and trying to get that worked out, but that's working its way through the court system. Uh, but once the that works its way through the court system, you know, tribal, state, provincial fisheries management agencies all sit down at the same table and figure out what what the best thing to do is to ensure not only meeting fisheries needs, but also uh, ensuring sustainability of the resource. That's a slippery slope because, you know, those Canadians uh, that have the, the essentially gill nets, quite literally, mm -hmm. you know, that um, a lot of people outside of here maybe don't know. But in Canada, you, you know, they gill net for walleyes. If you buy a walleye in a restaurant, chances are it came from Lake Erie from the Canadian side. In Ohio, we have shut that down. We just do perch. Um, but, you know, that's uh, a slippery slope, as they say, because, again, those nets uh, don't have much of a conscience and uh, sometimes uh, even if the limit is 100 you know you get 200 or there's been a lot of fines paid by people uh, because they've over bagged or whatever you over netted whatever you want to call it and uh, you know the fines don't seem to uh, dictate uh, what the impact is in my opinion but yeah well the the fortunate thing and having been on Erie for you know 24 years um Again, uh, each of the individual jurisdictions kind of maintains authority over how they administer their fishery, but we've got a quota system in place for walleye and yellow perch. And in Ontario, they're sitting at the same table as Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New York to determine what safe harvest levels are. Quotas are allocated to each of the jurisdictions, and then it's on the jurisdiction to ensure that they adhere to those harvest quotas. And for the most part, you know, yeah, you have some actors that, that, that cause issues, but for the most part, um, the agencies work together, uh, commercial fishery operated within the confines of safe harvest levels that are established by the Lake Erie Committee. And, and that's, that's just, you know, kind of a testament to strong partnerships and, 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 a, and a real commitment to coordinated fishery management that's not only characteristic of Erie, but also characteristic of the other Great Lakes as well. So is there anything you could leave us with uh, from the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission that we either didn't cover or we should know since you guys are not like a sexy organization, right? Like, I mean, this is not like amazing people are like, hey, I can't wait to talk about this, um, even though this stuff is impactful because ultimately it does keep our fishery what it is, even though you don't think about it like that or many of us don't until it's too late. Yeah. So, no, I mean, I think I think you're right. We, we are essentially a... Uh, an agency that was created by treaty and we essentially 
operate behind the scenes to help ensure that we have effective uh, consistent, coordinated fishery management across the base. And we don't have any management authority at all. We just work with people to make sure that the folks are um, uh, essentially on the same page relative to the vision and how they implement effective fishery management. And uh, then we've got other programs that are critically important, like the sea lamprey control piece, um, uh, trying to implement some of these uh, habitat and environmental restoration plans on the landscape to make more fish for folks. Um, granted, it's, yes, it's proactive and yes, it's long term. And, but at the end of the day, if we, if we continue to do the right things, um, we should be moving the system towards meeting uh, stakeholder and uh, fishery management needs across the basin. Well, you need to leave us with this. So I was telling producer dude about Jeffisms, and he's like, what are they? And I'm like, I never can get them right because it's like, that's the way my brain works. But I mean, crazier in a corn crib, Brad, even though you're going to correct me on that, because okay. I know I'm a little off. But can you give us a, a couple top Jeffisms if we were to like talk with your friends? Because a lot of them that I know we probably shouldn't say here, not we can't, but we probably shouldn't say, but give me a couple that are good, um, you know. Don't, don't leave me hanging. Producer dude has been waiting for this for like an hour. You, you, you're putting me on the spot. I can't think of any of them now. Crazier than a corn crib rat. I mean, that's... Uh, it's a shithouse rat. Come on, man. Yeah, okay. There we go. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, producer dude, they always get, they always clam up at the end, don't they? We have to like... Always, um, always. We have to provide them with these questions in advance. It wouldn't be as much fun, but they always just, it literally is like people looking like they're on the, you know, being indicted or something. They just look at us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would, you're, you're, the, the lines he says though, producer, dude, this isn't like a question you should be surprised with. Right. <laughs> he, he has those Missouri things, but yeah. at any Which rate, we'll, they, maybe they, we'll they drop them spontaneously though. <laughs> We'll drop them down in the comments uh, afterwards uh, by the time we get this thing rolling. But, uh, Jeff, I can't thank you enough for your time uh, and uh, joining us on the Big Water Podcast. Until the next, next episode, uh, producer dude, the I next almost what? popped out. Episode about? I'm a fishing guide, man. We're just doing a podcast. You know how it is. Like, what do you, you know? If you're too polished doing these, you know, it's probably phony or whatever. That's but right. We can't even remember where we're at. Producer, dude, we're on Big Water Fishing at YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Um, Anywhere you can get your podcasts, we're, we're yeah, there. That, that is way easier to say it that way. Yeah. Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, Google, Apple. Not Stitcher. Amazon. Not Stitcher. Not Good. Stitcher. Okay. Well, they went out of business. Remember, Stitcher's out. That's what our Pandora is now, right? Yes. Yes. Pay attention. Okay. Stay with me and pay attention. Thank you. Thank you. So producer dude, I know I'm always surprised at what you like and don't like when we have the podcast, like some fishing podcast. I'm like, Oh my God, that was great. And you're like, yeah, you know, cause you're not a fishing guy, but the fisheries or the biology stuff, you really seem to gravitate towards. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm like Jeff, I think in the regards, I've always been interested in weather and patterns and, you know, in currently now I'm always looking up the lake levels, um, you know, all that stuff, precipitation, you know, how's the lake, health all of that so that was very uh that was very interesting to me yeah and i think that the, the only thing we missed out on is the jeffisms this crazier than a uh whatever i mean he, he has these sayings that are like notorious for all the biology guys that he's worked with in the past and i don't know if he clammed up as much because he forgot or he was just you know like seeing his wife in the background or something or maybe you know what i mean going mm. I, I think but, it's one of those it just comes out of him when the situation and he can't do it on demand probably it doesn't and they're very out of character that's the thing that i was trying to you know it's, it's one of those deals like when you hear your grandma say something you know that you just wouldn't expect your grandma to say right um, but it's kind of one of those deals. But did you learn anything from this? Because I thought, you know, for me, knowing that it was way cooler water back in the day, but yet way more productive, like meaning way more fish back in the day compared to now, when we consider what we have as being the most really in the country, like per acre, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, I just learning which invasive species were the most, I don't want to say dangerous, but the, the you know, the ones that they're really having to watch, like, in, you know, kind of in order of its uh, threat to the ecosystem. I thought that was pretty interesting. I honestly would have flipped that list if I had to guess on on you know what was the most or or you know worst or whatever to me i was kind of surprised but um 
I guess, as he says, they're all bad. And because we don't know what they're going to do long term, but yet another uh, interesting podcast. We're always trying to bring you some different interesting guests and producer dude. Uh, they should send us a message if there's somebody they want to hear or have a topic idea, right? Um, yeah, topics would be great. You know, this is, well, you know, we're how many 72, 73 three podcasts in where we need ideas, you know? Yeah, it, we do. And it, you know, you have some different people on there. Like, um, if somebody hasn't listened to the Joe Cermelli one, you know, we talked about Joe kind of the person the, and the people and the behind the scenes, you know, on the first one and this, uh, this last one was just totally different than that. I, and I really liked that one. I don't know if you did or not, but, um, diff- different things. We, same thing. We've had Travis Hartman on several times talking about different fisheries things. That's a little different. Uh, but as things have changed, but uh, we're always looking for something good and interesting. And uh, I think sometimes the people that don't think that they're good or interesting and it being the best guest, me and you just talked about this with the Cermelli podcast where our buddy, uh, Mike uh, Weinhofer, Captain Mike, he brought the heat with the stories. And surprisingly that podcast didn't get as many downloads. I don't know if it was just timing, um, but a lot of people get on here and clam up, you know, Mike did not. Yeah. He, he, he brought it. (laughs) <laughs> that's we'll, we'll leave it at that and uh you'll listen to that and you can make the determination from there but until the next episode producer dude um let's go make some other videos okay sounds good